All right, I think we're here. Let's see. We've got a lot of different things to do today. This one is mostly about uh, different ways you can finish your 3D printed parts, like paint them different ways, um, make them look like other materials. Now, I didn't do a lot. I did print out several things that we can work on. I didn't do a whole lot of sanding and things like that. Uh, so that's kind of might hamper some of our uh, methods here that we're going to try out, but it'll give you this, the idea of how the methods work. And um, the more surface sanding and, and cleaning you do, the, the better these things work. Ours might have a little bit of issue, um, but let's see. First, let's look at what we got here. Um, so quiz one does open. So if you're in the course, you need to, uh, I think I left it open the whole week. So it's just 15 questions. Uh, they're all multiple choice. So in it, as long as you've been printing things, then it should be fine to uh, take quiz one and not have any trouble with it. Let's see when it does open. Three people have already done it. Um, so it closes on the 23rd. So you've got plenty of time to do it. I think once you open it, it does have a 30 minute attempt window um, once you start it. But uh, other than that, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, we've got OxoPrint coming up next class. So on Thursday, um, that'll be adding kind of this remote control system to our Ender. We'll put it on the Ender. I've actually got another printer out here that I'm working on. Let's look at what else we've got. Over here, this one, get this out of the way. This one's a TiVo Tornado. It's an older TiVo Tornado, and it's all torn apart because um, what we're doing with this, and we put a new board in the Ender 3. We put the SKR Mini E3 in it. Um, that's a pretty straightforward, you unplug all the wires and plug them into almost exactly the same spot you had before. It's relatively simple replacement. This one, I'm putting a different board in, and so I'm not going to go through, well, it would just be hours. Like, I don't even know how many hours. It would be many hours of just wiring up stuff. But this board, I've had to print like little cases for things. Um, the, the original TiVo, TiVo Tornado, um, it has this separate box that has all the controls and power supply in it, and I didn't want a separate box to deal with. So anyway, this board is the Duet. Uh, this is the Wi-Fi 2.0 board or Duet 2.0 Wi-Fi. I don't know which order it goes in, but it's a control board. Um, it's 32-bit. Um, it, it, it does have Wi-Fi built into it, so that's what made me think about it mm -hmm. and OctoPrint. So for the OctoPrint that we're going to install, I actually will install that one um, live so you can see because it's pretty straightforward. Um, this one has Wi-Fi built into it. We're going to have to use a Raspberry Pi on the Ender 3 to create a Wi-Fi uh, terminal. So this one, you know, it has the same type of thing where you plug in stepper drivers, plug in in stops. Um, the, the difficulty, for whatever reason, uh, this company, the company that makes the Duet, they're based in the UK, um, the connectors that they have here on the board don't match most all of the connectors on these Creality printers. Um, so you have to go modify all the connectors, uh, maybe even re-terminate them in some cases to get them to plug in here. Uh, so, and that's kind of boring to watch. So I've been working on that, uh, separately. Once I get it all set up, then we'll see what's different about this board. Basically it's going to have Wi-Fi built in and, um, it's going to use the web to update firmware. If I want to change something on the firmware, there's no need for me to go and recompile and put it on an SD card or send it through USB. Um, I can do it on the web. So that's a, a big advantage for this board. This board does cost more than the SKR board, um, maybe close to twice as much as the SKR or more. I don't know it. I don't remember the cost for it. Um, I'll have to look it up, but it does cost more. So it's not something you would want to do just as an experiment. Uh, that's kind of why I'm doing it so that you can see if it's something, if it adds value or not. Um, I do have a touch screen for it also, um, kind of like the one that we have over here. Um, that we'll add and um, this 
this is something that the uh, TiVo came with. This is a solid state relay. Uh, sometimes you want the bed of your heater, uh, well, the bed of your printer, the heated bed of your printer to heat up faster. Um, or maybe you just won't, don't like running the idea of running that kind of power through the board itself. Um, so this solid st state relay is going to run the power for the bed. Now the TiVo Tornado, you can see it's got a much larger bed and actually this bed runs off of uh, wall power so it, um, it's going to need this anyway but um, that's something you can add pretty easily uh, to any printer if you want the bed to be the bed's heating power to be supplied separately from uh, not having to go through the board itself because um, it does a lot of power um, particularly on one of these large beds like this this one has uh, but that came with the TiVo Tornado. I didn't add it separately. So we'll get to that. Once I have something to show everything connected together and it's up and running, then um, we'll look at what the the software side of that looks like and what does it let you do. Um, but I didn't think that me cutting off the ends of wires and putting new ends on over and over and over again would be very exciting. So this is where we're at on that. It's going to take a while uh, <clears throat> to do. So that'll come back sometime, probably not Thursday, but sometime. Um, Thursday, the main goal will be uh, Octoprint on the other printer. Today's main goal is we're trying to make our prints look like something they're not. So I've got a couple of different things. I've got these. If I can pick them up. These little guys. These are football card stand, or well, not football, but collectible trading card stands. So that you can stand up your card if it's in a top loader. Um, I just made these on Thingiverse. Not Thingiverse. I made them on Tinkercad. <laughs> um, and they're just a couple of shapes put together and printed out. Um, this is a raw one. There's Drew Brees. Uh, so this is kind of what I've been printing them to look like straight out of the box. They, I've printed them with a, a higher layer thickness, so I think this is 0.3 millimeters or 0.28, depending on which printer I printed on. Um, and so they're, they're going to have thicker layer lines, and I did not go in and um, sand them a lot, you know, fill in all these layer lines. There are a couple of things that you can do. A lot of them just end up sanding. So getting some kind of sanding stick, I use these kind of things a lot because they're already flat and have grit on them. Um, but getting some kind of flat sanding thing and sanding them. Um, I didn't do that just because I didn't have time. So this one's raw. This one has been spray painted with just a satin black. And this one, I was going to try a different thing on. I don't know how well it'll turn out, but I painted, spray painted it with a kind of glossy brown. Um, and... Uh, one thing that would certainly help is if we printed these uh, with smaller layer lines or we spent more time trying to fill in all those layer lines so that you don't see the layer lines because they're pretty visible. I don't know if they show up on camera very well, but I can see them pretty easily. So our, our finishing techniques on these may not be as good as it could be just because of that. Another thing you can do, you probably can, this one's really bad, probably can see the top layer the layer lines on there. There are settings in most slicers that um, in Cura, I think it's called ironing. Let me load up Cura and check that out eventually whenever it loads up. Um, but it will, on flat top layers like this, um, it literally uses the hot end, the heated hot end, and irons it flat. So I could have probably eliminated most of this texture on the top um, by turning on ironing. It does cost you a little bit more time. Um, let's see if I can cure is open. Yeah, shell enable ironing um, and it will on flat surfaces like at the top of this one it will drag the nozzle back across. Sometimes it does um, um, add a tiny bit of material. I don't know if Cura's does or not or if you even have the option to add material to the iron layer or not. Uh, some slicers, I think maybe slicer lets you add material and they don't call it ironing. I, think, I don't remember what they call it. But um, it drags the nozzle back across the surface and irons it flat. And it actually does a pretty good job of that. So if it, it really works best on flat surfaces 
on the top like this. So this could probably have been made a lot smoother by just doing that. And it wouldn't add a lot to the time, but it might have added um, a good surface on there that you wouldn't have to sand or wouldn't have to sand very much. <clears throat> All right, so this one, we're going to uh, use a technique called dry brushing to make this one look sort of like a um, blackened metal that's kind of rust, not rusted, but um, worn, worn. This one, I'm going to try uh, a thing that I haven't tried with these before. I've done it on a different scale, but not this scale. Um, and we're going to try to make it look wood, wooden. Um, I printed this little tiny wood grain. Let's see, I'll show you it from Thingiverse. This thing, now by default, this is, I don't know, like three inches wide or something like that. Um, I printed it out, obviously, much smaller. And it's got a wood grain texture on it. It didn't print too well right in that area just because it couldn't resolve how tiny I was making it. Um, it is flexible. So this is from TPU. Uh, this is this material. It's not that orange one that we had before. This is one of the samples I get from uh, whatever they're called now. Um, MakerBox. I, don't, I think they might have changed their name, but I don't know. Maybe the company changed their name. But MakerBox is the same. But um, this material, so it's a TPU blue. Um, I printed it at 228. I did slow down a lot to print it. I think I printed at 20 millimeters per second. Um, I did have cooling on at layer four, I believe, but the first four layers were no cooling. Um, I had the bed at, I think I put it at 40 maybe. I don't remember. I did, I did have the bed on. Anyway, it printed pretty well. This is uh, a lot more flexible material. You can see all the spray paint from yesterday uh, than that orange that we used last time, which I don't even know where I put the orange piece that we printed um, the tire. Oh, I think one of my boys took it because it looked cool, so they took it. Um, so this is a lot more flexible, a lot more rubbery. Um, and I did print it on the ender with the Bowden tube. So um, it will print, you know, it, it prints much slower so that there's not as much chance of um, it binding up or spitting out of here. And also on this one, there is very little unconstrained path in there. Um, and once it gets in here, it's pretty much all constrained. Um, we can change this tube out if we felt like there was uh, not um, a good enough path inside here, like it was too big of a diameter. I do have some Capricorn tubing <clears throat> that we could put on there, but it worked fine. So I'm not going to worry about changing it right now. Um, and the only thing was you had to print it pretty slowly. And, uh, but it did work. I printed something else that we'll use later. So those are some of the painting techniques that we'll look at. I printed out Skeletor here. He's very shiny because I've painted him with, I tried, so he also had layer lines that you can still see. So you can still pick up the layer lines, or look down, layer lines on the top surfaces in particular. The front's not so bad, back's not so bad, but on the top surfaces that there are quite a bit of layer lines. So I sprayed him with adhesion promoter, this stuff. And then I put lots of, I broke basically all the spray painting rules that uh, you can because I wanted a really thick coat on there. I didn't want a thin coat. Um, so I sprayed him with this and that's where he's at right now. I just didn't want to do that on camera. For one thing, I can't paint in here. I can't spray paint in here anyway. Um, that would be a big mess. So his goal is to look kind of like a uh, bronze-ish statue in the end. And we're going to use this stuff for him, rub and buff. So it's this little waxy pigment that you can rub onto a surface and buff it out and it kind of makes it look metallic. Um, then we're going to do some casting stuff. So let's start with, mm -hmm. let's start with, um, I think this one's going to have the most chance of being successful. So let's start with it. So what we're going to do with this is you need some kind of, we'll work right here, some kind of paper towel because this is the dry brushing technique. So you need a brush. In this case, you don't want a super fancy brush, just something. This one, I want a wider one because I want uh, to cover more area. 
you need some kind of silver paint uh, and hopefully it's not all dried up it's not you just get a little bit on here and then you wipe most of it off because you don't uh, want big globs of this on your part and then all this is a good candidate for dry brushing because it has all these sharp edges and then you just kind of paint across it and now one this is one reason if you were able to zoom in let me zoom in some so that you can get the downsides of what we're doing here let's see if we can get it turned the right way there we go you can see particularly over here you can see layer lines this will highlight all of those layer lines um, so the more time you spend getting your layer lines fixed up the uh, better this or any of these techniques unless for some reason you wanted layer lines um, the better any of these techniques are going to work because most of them are going to add they're going to accentuate those layer lines in a way that you probably didn't want for it to happen but assuming you're going for something that looks good from 10 feet away or even a few feet away then this will work fine and this is all you do you just randomly like until you're satisfied that it looks worn enough so it kind of simulates the idea that there's metal under here and it was painted and then that paint has worn off over time uh, you can do a similar thing with just a pencil like if you want more control over just the corners um, I don't have a graphite pencil here on the desk anywhere but pencil well if you just rub pencil across the sharp corners it'll give a similar effect without the scratches everywhere but now that was to, that took us I don't know what 30 seconds maybe um, not long at all so I'll show you the paint I used in case it matters but it's nothing special except I dropped it use this so a satin Valspar and sprayed it on there last night did it last night you do want this to be dry obviously but now you've got something that kind of has this metal uh, worn look I used that same thing on this piece in here this one I actually did sand a little bit more and you know it, that that looks reasonably like uh, an older piece of metal that's got some paint or maybe uh, maybe it was blackened or whatever um, and that looks reasonably like that so does this you can pick up a lot more layer lines on this piece because I didn't try to eliminate the layer lines um, if you don't like sanding then uh, you can go in and like I said print thinner layers so this was printed as as thick a layer as I possibly could just to spit out the prints really quick um, so thinner layer lines obviously would help sanding would help thicker primer would help I'll show you I don't think I have the primer here let me get the primer this kind of primer um, in, the ones that say sandable or um, high build or filler you know things like that those are the ones that are going to go in there and fill in a lot of the layer lines for you you still need to sand that um, unless you want that texture sometimes that that primer texture is what you want but assuming you're trying to get rid of texture then you need to sand them with something flat you don't you don't actually push down you you let the sandpaper do all the work um, but something flat that uh, will even out the surface there but this looks reasonably well and I would imagine that if we put this let's see I don't know oh wait that's backwards that way and we look at it from oh well with that being backwards I probably should do more on the back side of it I didn't actually do much over there maybe I need to redesign these parts because they, they actually look pretty good on this side but I made that be the back because I wanted uh, I needed a little bit more uh, surface on the back so it would stand up correctly um, but that looks reasonably well so we can find it from a distance like this worn piece of metal that we milled out and stuck our top loader in 
So that's a super easy way. It's just called dry brushing. Um, and obviously you can use any colors you want, but um, if you're trying to look for an old metal type of look, then flat or satin black with silver paint dry brushed across it kind of gives you that effect pretty convincingly until you get up and like you're looking at it up close then you can say oh well that what are all those lines in there now the good thing is these lines let's see if i can get it to focus on that i don't know if i can but these lines for metal kind of makes sense if you think of the part being machined on like a cnc uh, mill and they're the milling lines so you could kind of get away with them um, if you wanted to. So that's one way. Pretty simple. Um, I keep wanting to put this thing in backwards. I think I need to redesign it so that the uh, both sides have that angle, that bevel on them. Um, let's see. All right, this one. Actually, no, no, let's do this one. I'm, I'm less certain about this technique. So um, because I've not done it. And this is going to be a little bit tough. Now this... This one, these handles here, these are plastic, but they look pretty wooden. If I can get them in camera, they look pretty wooden. I'll, this is, they were spray painted a similar color to this, although I don't think it was glossy. And one side, they're a little bit different. See, one side's a little bit duller than this one's a little bit redder. These, I'll go ahead and explain. I don't want to do this process, but I'll explain it. Um, this one, I just spray painted some color similar to this and then used really thin layers of paint, like this kind of paint, but uh, you know, brownish color. And I didn't, I used a thinner brush, like somewhere in between these two, actually. These are, this is really thin, that's really wide. And just kind of randomly, I did go in one direction to simulate wood grain, you know, having a direction to it. Just went across there and painted really thin layers of um, a different color, a darker color over that light color. Then what I did is I used, where'd it go? This. I put this on top of it. So this does two things. Um, one, it adds color. So this is an antique walnut. And it adds satin finish. And it's a polyurethane. And so you get a little bit of shine on there. This one, this side I painted uh, again with a dull coat because I wanted to see what the shine was like if it wasn't there so this is dulled after it this is just it um without being dulled so it's still got a little bit of shine i actually like this side more than the dull side although this one probably looks a little bit more like an old piece of wood this one has that characteristic but it's a little bit uh maybe less believable i don't know could just be a different kind of wood on camera it actually looks pretty good in person, uh, this to me, this side doesn't look quite as realistic as this side. But on camera, they both look reasonably like old, worn wood. Um, so that's that's one way to get wood. This one, we're going to try this tiny little wood grain applicator. Now it's going to have problems because it's you know I'm not going to be able to get into all of these. But let's see how it works because I don't actually know. Um, I've used these, you know, you use, you can buy these or you can print their, your own. And, uh, like for making a tabletop or something like that, a fake wood grain tabletop. So I've got this darker reddish brown, probably not the ideal color for this, but it's what I picked up. So it's what I'm going to use. All right. So. Step one is that you have to put a light, like, you know, I guess you don't have to do light then dark, you could do dark then light, um, but you have to put one color on and let it dry. So I went with the light color and then we paint on, I don't want my silver to come in there. We're gonna just paint this on. I'm just gonna do this side right here I don't think we need to necessarily do the whole thing, but we paint this on. And you're not trying to, you know, be neat about it or anything. And then you put, let's see, yeah, we're on camera. Put this guy down and you just drag it across there. And let's see, 
Do I like that? I can see the wood grain kind of coming through, but it's not quite, and I didn't get a lot up here. Let's try, let's try. We might need more paint actually, but let's try, I put a little bit of water on here. Part of the problem that we're having is that there, that's beginning to look a little bit wood. See, right in there, we got we have a decent wood grain texture. It's getting kind of caught up in the grooves of the print. Um, so I don't know if I like this technique as much as that. Actually, looks that looks that's not terribly unrealistic. It's the wrong colors. The colors are a little bit weird. Um, uh, the, the the reddish color here and the greenish brown base don't really work together so we we would need to select our colors better but the pattern in here actually does look like wood grain now on camera I'm looking at it and it's like eh, it's kind of hard to maybe believe let's see if I can get the top to work. I don't think I'm gonna get the top to work very well though um, because it has such texture on it from the other thing but we'll try just to see I think this technique is going to be simpler most of the time where you just take really thin layers like watered down paint uh, and let you know put a layer on almost like a, what's called a glaze um, that's that's kind of how the really old master painters uh, they painted a lot of the pictures that have a lot of depth to them is they used really thin glaze layers to add all this depth to the paint and I think that's going to work better on most situations for what we're doing here. But let's try this. I need to get a lot of paint on here. Whoops. I'm trying to barely hold it so I don't paint myself, but I'm dropping it. All right, put that somewhere. Now this one's gonna to be tough because uh, it's gotta work inside here. I don't know. It's tough to get to the ends. I'm going to let this dry and then we'll come back and look at it and see if it looks wood grainish or not. I think the better technique for wood grain is going to be what I described with this. All right, we'll let it dry though and, and uh, come back to that because it's still kind of wet right now. All right. Now this one is actually a really cool technique, but again, it's gonna suffer because I sped up things with uh, trying to get the layer lines here gone. So on, on the front, you can't, you can't see too many layer lines, but on the top surfaces, you can even feel them and see them. So remember this one printed him out, I think I did print at 0.2 millimeter layer height. So this was a nine and a half hour print or so. Let's see if I can get more room here. Um, so this is Skeletor from Masters of the Universe. I just found it on Thingiverse. And I thought, you know, these, this technique kind of works good when you have lots of details because it's going to be sort of like dry brushing where it um, is going to pick out the raised surfaces um, and leave the deeper ones uh, whatever color you started with. Uh, so I did start with... Like I said, this duplicolor, uh, here it is. Did start with this. It would have probably been better to, I did do the adhesion promoter. Um, I probably could have gotten rid of some a few more layer lines with extra heavy coat of primer. I was just a little bit afraid because I wasn't gonna be able to, or well, it, was going, it would take forever to sand this thing if I wanted to. So I wasn't, I was thinking I'm not going to sand it. So I, I was thinking I'd get a kind of rougher texture, which might be okay, but uh, I didn't do that. I just instead did this one. And I use this one because it is gloss and typically gloss paints uh, are thicker. And so they'll cover up more layer lines. Now I do end up with this shiny surface, which might hurt me in the end. Um, one thing you can do is they do make uh, matte clears that you could spray over it and bring it back down and not be so shiny but this one 
is the rub and buff. I have three different colors of rub and buff. Um, I think I'm going to use the bronze one, but I've got or a gold one. Uh, here's an ebony, so that wouldn't do much on here because my base is black and this is black, so it wouldn't really um, wouldn't really show up anywhere. These two would work, gold leaf and silver leaf. Um, the obviously, if I put the silver leaf on here, it will probably look kind of like uh, kind of like this actually, you know that that kind of metal. So I want to try the gold leaf. I think there are other colors. These are just the three that I have. They're actually kind of expensive and hard to get. I think I got these from Hobby Lobby, um, but they're eight dollars maybe for this. Now the other the thing about it is though, you use a super tiny amount, so a little drop of this goes a long way. Um, but we need something to put it on, um, and it's probably going to ruin whatever we put it on. So I'm going to use an rag that I've was using I don't want one that's gonna get lint everywhere though I'm gonna use this kind it maybe not won't be too linty all right so oh this one I've never even opened I keep losing where my camera is there we go so I've got to open it first okay and let's see I'll try this on the back first so a tiny little bit. Ooh, wow, that's really gold. All right, that's fine. It'll be fine. And then we, I, I don't want all of that to clump up on there. And you just kinda, and you can see where I started, it's got a much stronger coloring than where I'm at over here. Um, but you don't want to get too um, like too much pressure. I, I'm not sure which side I like more. Um, on camera, this side certainly looks better. Um, in person, this one is much more subtle, but it's actually pretty cool. Um, so I'm not sure which side I like more. I think I'm going to add more to this side. If you press too hard, then you're losing some of the effect. It, it makes it gold but you're losing the effect of all of the deep recesses still having this darker color, and so you lose a lot of the cool stuff. So you don't want to get too aggressive with it. But I think it's working pretty well. And it has a metallic, like the there's metallic particles in these particular rubbing buffs. I don't know if all rubbing buffs have metallic particles or if you can get different kinds. The ones I have wax metallic finish so they even have tiny little metallic particles in them but i don't know if i want to do the whole thing because it does take a while to to do but i kind of kind of do because it's looking pretty cool um it is a wax though so once you do this it's kind of the last thing you do uh you you can't really do much on top of it because it's going to be tough to like paint on top of this wax that's everywhere but that looks I mean that looks pretty cool in person it, it looks really cool um, let's do some on the front because obviously that's where more of the details are let's, let's do his face Now, maybe you don't know who Skeletor is, but uh, it was an 80s cartoon. He was the bad guy, obviously. But there's no real, like, and you can see the layer lines. You can see them, but if you get any distance away, they're not, they're not bad at all. So think we did a good enough job it would have probably been wise to just take since the you know the very peak up here um, wouldn't have been too difficult to sand it would have probably been good to you know sand right up here a little bit I don't even know if you could get down in there to sand but uh, this is kind of the procedure there's not a not a technique to it as much as you literally 
put this stuff on and then rub it around rub and buff and that's kind of it and then you you decide if you have enough or not and the silver would give you a similar effect except um, it would look more uh, like that first little top loader card thing we made so this stuff is pretty cool around eight dollars for a tube of it you pretty much have to order it unless you uh, happen to have a Hobby Lobby and they happen to have it in stock I probably will come back and do some more of this on here um, but in the interest of time we'll We'll call him good. I'll see if I can get a picture, not a picture, but a, get him on here. Like, cause on the camera, it's very, um, you can see way more black than there is in person. Um, I don't know, maybe if I change the contrast or the exposure. There, it's maxed out on the exposure. Um, and you can kind of get a better idea for what he's looking like. That one's maybe a little more representative. So you can see where maybe I need to add a little more in places or not. Um, the shininess of the, the spray paint underneath there might be too much. Um, it would have probably been a little better uh, to go and uh, put a dull coat, just a clear dull coat over the uh, black glossy coat. I wanted the glossy again so that I had um, more thicker paint layers on here. You know, I, it was cold when I painted. Uh, I painted really thick layers, and um, all of that is things you shouldn't do when you're trying to save detail. But in this case, I was actually trying to obscure the layer line details, and it still did uh, do okay with the details of the print itself. So that actually looks really cool on camera. It just isn't as or at least on what I'm looking at is it's it's more splotchy. It's it's in person way more uh, evenly distributed than it shows up on the camera. But that's rub and buff. It's pretty easy to use. Um, and the thing I like about this and this is that the technique does not matter nearly as much as just putting the stuff on there. Obviously, you can put too much or too little uh, and not get quite the right effect, but it's random, you know, the, the whole point of these are that they're worn, they're old, and they uh, are showing signs of wear, and that's random. You don't, you don't have to try and pick out little details here and there. Um, this one, not so random, this wood grain version. It does look a little more wood grain-ish, although on camera, again, it looks very messy. Um, but in person, it actually looks kind of wood grain-ish. I don't think I will like this one as much um, as I like this version of wood grain. I might have to show you how to do this one. I just don't have the stuff out to do it. Um, we'll, I'll probably, we'll just do a follow-up later whenever I think about it, uh, and we'll do that. All right, so these are a couple of ways that you can make things um, printed parts. So all of these were directly printed, even this guy, and make them look a little bit like other things. Maybe if I zoom out, you can start to get a little bit more sense of what this guy is looking like but it looks you know if i if i kept working on this and if i hadn't made it shiny i don't know that i can dull coat it now because i don't know that you can paint over rub and buff very easily but i'll i don't know i'll, I'll spray the back of him and uh see how that goes and uh show him later off uh later on not today but uh maybe for thursday and what does he look like after he's all done it might ruin him but we can always print another one so that's making plastic parts look like something else um, what if you actually want them to be something else so that's a little bit different so we've got to do a couple of different things and it doesn't rely on paint so here's a couple of ways if you want the part to actually be different let's clear out our space and one thing I've well no actually let's put this up here all right I'm going to use a metal tray this time just because this gets messier and messier the more we go all right 
So one thing we can do, I printed this. So this is, and we can probably zoom back in. So this is a TPU, so it's flexible material mold, and it's a mold of, um, let's see if I can find it, just so you can see what it's supposed to look like when we're done. This, I kind of scaled it down just to save material um, because I'm not actually trying to make these things. But here, it's, I think it's this one is, I think it's that one. Can't remember which one I went and downloaded now. It's one of these pirate coins. I did this one before, but I think this is this one. So what I did here, let's see if this, well, actually I can show you what I did. All right, so I went to Tinkercad. I like Tinkercad just because um, it is very quick to do. So there's the there's the mold. There's the little top loader stand. Um, so let's uh, let's just make a new one. So first is well we got to download our yeah this is the one I did. Uh, let's see I think I did this one. We downloaded this thing, Pirates of the Caribbean coin piece one or one piece all right um and then i picked i don't know some cylinder and i made it i made I, I actually measured these things you can type in any number you want in here uh but i'm we're just showing you how i did it i'm gonna I'm not gonna print this then i imported the pirates of the caribbean coin except it crashed so or it didn't crash, it just having trouble with that one for some reason. Not sure. Let's see. Maybe we can drop it straight in here. There we go. We can do it that way. All right. So um, there is a limit on the size. I think it said 25 megabytes, which is actually a huge uh, STL file. But here it is. I turned it into a negative, and then I... You know, I care. I did way, way more careful here, but um, you can actually align things perfectly. Let's let me show you how to do that. Make that a little bit bigger. Now, if I, I the two things I want to align, if I select them, so I've got the orange blob selected, and then shift select the coin. This button up here um, is align, and you've got all these handles that you can choose how to align. Align the edge. Align. The middle, I want the middle. Align the middle in this direction, and you can align vertically also. Um, but now these are concentric things, and one of them's a hole, and I don't remember what's on the other side of this uh, pattern. Let's, let's flip it over. Oh, it's basically the same thing. All right, um, and then I can select them both and group them together, and now I've got the negative you know inside here now this has got a lot of tiny details which may not survive the print and then the cast but um, I made it even smaller so we have even less chance of it surviving but we're gonna do it anyway and you can see the process so what I did is I did that process sort of I've made it a little fancier with the little bevel here and I, I raised a little ring around it so that there's uh, a little pool that can form so it's not so thin um, but there is detail down in there. I don't know how much of it we'll actually be able to capture, but we'll give it a shot and see what happens. Um, so it is important that it's flexible so that I can pop this thing out once I've got it cured. This is going to be resin. So I've got this. These are Smooth Cast 320. Um, they're uh, two part resin. If I can get them to stay there. Two part resin um, from Smooth On is the company. This is actually a sample size. Uh, normally they come much larger than that, but usually for what I'm doing, the sample size is fine. Now these are older. In fact, these are many years old. I don't even see a date on them, but they're many years old in the, you know, in the 10 year range old uh, since I've bought these. So there is a chance that they've gone uh, bad, but they're both liquid. I checked this morning. So they should still work. Gotta shake them up. That one's got a little bit of leaking going on on it. 
That's why I'm doing it over here. All right, let's shake them up. These mix by one to one by volume. A lot of these materials um, mix by weight, um, but these actually mix one to one by volume. So that's one of the reasons I like them. What they're going to do is I'm going to mix them together, and then we're going to have about two or three minutes before they harden. Um, so I've got this little tray to mix them in right there. And I've got a little deal here. Obviously it's not going to take much. I'll, I'll mix way more than we end up needing, but that's okay. Um, and I've got something to mix with, sort of. Let me see if I can find something better to mix with. All I see up here are some little toothpicks, which are probably going to be a little on the small side. Let me find something. Maybe I should have printed a little mixer. All right, we're going to mix with that. All right, let's see. Now, one of these I'm supposed to do first. Let's see. I don't remember. I think there's part A and part B, but I think part B is the one that you're supposed to mix, like pour out and mix it up first and then put in part A. I don't know why it's not the other way around, but I think that's the way it is. So let's see if we can not make a mess with this. Now, we are not doing the uh, best way to do this. See all these little bubbles, these little air bubbles that are in here? I don't know if you can see them. Let's see if I can get the camera in a reasonable spot. All these little air bubbles are actually going to um, have problems for uh, trapping air in here, but... We're not going to be too worried about it. Um, I did have, yeah. I do have some colorant. Let's make this guy, let's make it red. So if you want to add color, there's these super strong color tints. Um, you can mix them in before you mix it up. Again, you, with a lot of these, they, they flash or they cure very quickly. Let's just do two drops. Probably only need one drop for this tiny amount, but I did two. All right. Now it's just gonna it's gonna stay liquid for a long indefinitely now until it just cures in the air until you put the other part in there, and then there's an exothermic reaction, so it will get hot. Um, so you do have to be careful of what your mold is made of because. Um, it has to be able to withstand the temperature that's going to be created in it when I mix these two things together. All right, so that was part B. Let's get part A. Actually, let me get a throwaway brush. got a throwaway cheapy brush here that um, we can use to because I've got such tiny details inside here I'm, I'm gonna use the brush to uh, force some of this stuff down into the little gaps or whoops let's not spill it all oh this has got a uh, messy cover on it Probably is not going to help us. All right, one to one by volume. So there's our. I might have been a little short. This is one of these things are all messy. Um, so that's one of the reasons I got this tray out is because I don't want to get mess everywhere. All right. So we'll mix this in here, and now we've got 
you know, somewhere in the range. Hopefully, hopefully we've got enough uh, mixture here that it is not going to go off on us before we get it and it will actually set up. All right, I wanna stop right there and try to make sure this gets down in the gaps down there. Um, if you're doing this and you're trying to make things perfect, then you want vacuum chambers. Um, we're just gonna pour a little thin stream that will help pop a lot of the bubbles before they actually, whoops, I'm dropping over there. Wasn't paying attention. All right, so there, it's more or less that. Got plenty extra in there. Um, see all the bubbles there? They are, um, normally what you would do is vacuum cast. You can do a little tapping around on the surface here to try and get the bubbles to come up to the top. And we'll let it go. The brush is pretty much useless after you've done this. So make sure it's one that you don't care to keep. And hopefully it will cure. Now again, like I said, these are really old resins, but um, we'll see. Um, so I printed this in TPU so that uh, hopefully we'll be able to flex the mold and get it out of there. Obviously, the other way you do this is you print the part you want. So you print print this guy normally, not the reverse of it, but you print it normally. Um, and the, uh, the mold, you actually go and get uh, the same kind of material like this, except you get the silicone version and you cast around it. That process, um, oh, you can see it starting to cure. See that, that lighter color? You can actually see it in real time uh, curing. So it is gonna cure, that's good. Um, anyway, you can cast in silicone around the part that you want to create and then create your mold in that silicone. Um, you'll get a lot higher detail. So obviously I'm losing, I'm losing detail. Um, for one thing, I'm printing in this TPU, which I didn't print at a super thin layer. I printed at point two millimeters, I believe, or maybe I went down to like 0.18, um, but um, I didn't print it very thin at all, thin layers, and it's printed, so it's going to have layer lines inside the mold, and so I'm, I'm losing detail on several stages here, and uh, then we're going to rely on this mixture to uh, go down in there and get in all of those details, so we won't get a, a great copy, but... Um, the good thing about this kind of stuff, which it's getting a little bit goopy, which is a little concerning to me. It should be way more rigid, but it's uh, very goopy. I'll let it sit there for a while and see if it can actually uh, cure all the way. I might not have mixed in enough of the part A. I might have been a little shy on part A, which will make it cure, take longer to cure. Um, but we'll let that sit there and we might have to come back to it next time um, I'm not sure it's still kind of still kind of going off but right now this in the, the the leftovers are a little soft so that means those are a little soft also uh, but we'll we'll come back and see how it does later on maybe hopefully today we'll be able to uh, demold it but we might have to wait till next time because I uh, uh, think I didn't put enough of my really old part A in there. All right, so the goal here is if once I get a really good print, I can either print the mold, which again, I'm gonna lose some detail because the mold itself is printed and all of those little layer lines are gonna show up in the part that I cast from it. Um, a better process if you're wanting to save details is to print the actual part and create a mold around it with silicone. I just didn't want to show that in here because it's it's lengthy. Like that takes hours to do uh, the mold setup. So I couldn't do it live. All right. Uh, so we'll let's let this go. I'm going to move this off to the side. 
and we're going to do one other thing. Get this out of the way. This is probably just going to be trash. Let's get it. Except I kind of need to... Eh, it's getting, getting better. Okay, uh, let's try and clean some of this up for our next thing. This I'm going to save. Um, when this cures, you can usually just pop it out of there. All right. So this one you get is actual metal. So when this, assuming this stuff ever cures, it's going to be a plastic, so a resin, um, hard material plastic, but uh, not, not. It'll still be brittle. You could break the things. Um, it seems like it's curing pretty well. It's not too hot either, which actually you want it to. I, I could probably uh, put a heat gun on it or something like that and speed it up. All right. But now I had another part. Gotta orient where all my stuff is. Well, first of all, here's what I made the last time I did this. So this is that uh, other pirate coin, and this is actual metal. It's not aluminum. It is a uh, like a pewter. So it's a really low temperature metal. Um, and we've got this, which is. Um, I scaled down again. I scaled all these things down just to save time to print them So it kind of hampers how well they can do what they're supposed to do because they're smaller um, But I, I got to do everything in this little tiny space. So I made it all smaller um, So I've got a couple of things Here's a block. I just got this off of Amazon. I cut a corner off of it. This is that corner now We're gonna redo that one I've got some cornstarch I've got some clay so Delft clay they are uh, like a uh, if you've ever done metal casting it's like a green sand so let's get some of it out here without making too big of a mess hopefully Although I think it's, it's going to be a mess. Okay, there's that. Maybe it's not going to be a mess. Now I've got to find my other part. Where did I put it? Oh, here we go. So I printed this. Printed a little open mold box. So, um, this is going to be a one part mold. <laughs> yeah, it does. It actually is very uh, yummy looking. I have not actually tried to taste it though. All oh, right, so here's last time. Here's the mold I use, or the, the pattern I used to make this guy. This time, I guess I could use that again, but I have this one. So, this is a, like. 50% I think size pirate belt. I don't know why the pirate thing. I guess I was on Thingiverse and I looked up pirate coin um, and Then for some reason this was also on there. So this is a pirate a miniature pirate belt buckle So we're gonna put it down here um, Now I am choosing these particular things for a reason Let's Get it turned so you're not looking at it sideways um, and the reason is uh, these are all one-sided so if you ever need to do two-sided molds Then that's a little bit more complicated where you have to have one half and another half um, It's t totally doable, but it is a lot more involved. So these are all open pour one-sided things You know, I've got one cavity. I pour stuff in the top here I've got only detail on one side the back is just flat uh, And so that does make things much simpler if you can do it that way um, it does limit, obviously, the things you can make because you only have one side to work with. Um, I had a little, well, I had this I'll use to tamp down. But the idea is we get this in our little mold box, and then we put some 
Now this is kind of, I'm not going to bother with sifting it or anything like that, but got to get this in there. Again, you could make much better, uh, re you could have much better results if you did things like sift out the sand and um, I've probably used some of this, in fact here, See, I've used that piece before. You really shouldn't use that again, the, the one that's been burnt, but uh, I'm not going to be too worried about it. So here we're just packing in as best we can. Put some more in there. And we're going to melt this uh, low temp melting metal in uh, basically a tiny little sort of like a hot plate except it's like this little cup i'll get it out in a second once i once i get this sorted it also looks like our coin might might have finished up See, there's another piece where I've uh, used that sand already. But to, in order to do this in a reasonable amount of time, we're cutting some corners. And it'll be all right. So the more time you take you know preparing all this stuff you'll get better results we're just going for the general idea of how this works all right so now i probably now that i think about it i should have put i didn't do it i showed you the cornstarch i needed to um put cornstarch on that uh part that we wanted to make a mold of to make it easier to get out of there and, you know, I can see where it didn't form all the way around it. I, in fact, this corner right here, I noticed it, um, it was just too late to reprint it, but this corner lifted up over here and uh, that's gonna just make it uh, try to, the sand try to come under there. So that's not gonna work very well. Um, let's pick a spot here. Actually, let's tap it a couple of times and break it loose to save some of these details I'm pretty sure that these little tiny details in here since I didn't uh, do any mold release which I was just going to use the cornstarch they're probably not going to release very well uh, the 3d prints are always hard to release anyway because they have ridges all those little layer lines or ridges in there and they, they grab the sand pretty bad so you are limited if you're just going to take a 3D print directly off the printer and, and build a mold around it, you are limited sometimes on the details you can get. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can get without destroying too much here. Wow, it's actually in there pretty good. may have to undo it and put some release the cornstarch on there or do the other thing that I had the other coin there because maybe we can just tear up this one edge oh see it's not releasing come on see how it it went around the edge that's because the print lifted up And this little part is not necessarily made for casting. It doesn't have draft on it or anything like that. Um, that's why the coin worked better. But I wanted to do this one. We'll get something. It'll be sort of like this, but see how some of the sand stuck in all those little gaps and around there, we'll lose those details, but that's okay. 
let's let's just carry on with what we've got. All right. So assuming you get your mold done well, um, use some release to get your part out better, and um, see how it, you can see how it peeled up and sand was allowed to go underneath there, and it did that on maybe all of this corner is that way too. So it definitely got under there, which creates problems when you're trying to cast and do your mold from one side. But we got our general shape. Here's what we're gonna to use to melt. So just this. So let's move this off to the side. We're actually gonna remelt this guy. Got a little stand. And you just plug it in. There's no on off. There's no temperature control. You plug it in until the, the stuff melts. So I need to get power. Which is down here. Alright. And it doesn't take terribly long to melt. I probably could have uh, started it up a little earlier. It does get hot, obviously, because it's melting metal, but this stuff melts uh, much lower temperature than uh, like aluminum or something like that. Let me see if I can find it on Amazon. I think I got it from Amazon. There we go. That way you can watch both things. Low temp, temp metal. Let's see. Yeah, here's here's this is not the exact same one, but it's this type of stuff. So, um, seventeen dollars. This is for what? One pound. Um, so that's about. I think that is the same amount that I had. Um, and this this one's bismuth though. Um, I don't think the one that I have is bismuth. And this one has like thirty two percent lead. I actually had got one of the lead free ones. Uh, let's see. This one. Now this one costs, well, this is two pounds. Um, but once you try to avoid the lead, so the lead-free pewter, um, costs more. Or at least this particular one does. But, um, this melts, does it say what temperature it melts at? Uh, well, that one's still pretty hot, 563. Well, if I find the one that I actually bought, that is a pretty low temperature and lead free. I'll show it to you, but there are uh, things like that on Amazon. Just making sure it's heating up there. All right, let's go back over here. And it kind of all melts at once, like as soon as it. Yeah, it's heating up. All right, let's check while we're waiting. This thing seems to, it's still kind of soft but let's see if we can demold it it's stuck in there pretty good though uh oh uh oh it might have might have grabbed too much to it um so i did spray some mold release on here but i don't think i sprayed enough mold release on here um tpu so i've got it off to the side it does have a tendency to stick to stuff, but it, I am getting it out of there. So this silicone, like if you were to make a silicone mold from a print, um, silicone basically only sticks to other silicone. TPU, however, sticks to all kinds of stuff and you have to use a lot of mold release, which maybe I didn't use enough. You didn't, I didn't do it on camera. I'd already sprayed it on there. Let me get this over here. Check on our metal. So I'm not hopeful that we're gonna get any details on the front of our coin here with the 3D printed mold. Now were this uh, actual silicone mold, we'd get all those details. But I kind of think it's gonna stick too much and we're not gonna be able to reuse our mold. Normally that's one of the reasons you, you mold something is that you can do it over and over again, but Wow, yeah, it's going to stick way too much. The good news is that it did harden. 
the bad news is that it is not letting go of the mold. Also, oh yeah, I can, I can see the edges here of our metal beginning to melt. I can smell it a little bit too. Well, I'm afraid that the tiny little details in our coin in this one just grabbed on too much and I don't know that I'm going to be able to get it out of there. I might have to go put it in the vise and pry it out. Um, so I'm going to say that uh, TPU for a direct cast is going to be not ideal unless you can get a lot of mold release down in there or you don't have too many fine details. I might do this again with something that has much fewer details, but like what's happening is like it's caught all in every one of those little grooves and and it's really gotten a hold of it. Just getting there. Hmm. So it's tougher to make your parts directly in uh, another material. This actually will will work pretty well. Other than you know we we have uh, we we we've tried to do something a little bit too detailed in there. I wanted to go ahead and melt. I guess I should have started it up a little earlier. Um, that it was ready to go. I don't know if I'll ever get this other thing out of here. It will certainly destroy the mold to get it out, that's for sure. If I can get it out of there at all. Oh, there it goes. All right, it's kind of fun to watch it melt. All right, so that's pretty much melted. Um, I'm not gonna worry with like trying to scrape off the dross or anything like that. We're just gonna, I don't even know if I have enough in here to, to fill up the whole mold. It doesn't look like I do. We'll get what we can get. Also with open, oh, oh that's stuck in there. I just didn't want to cut another big piece off of the, uh, off of the uh, block that I have just because I didn't want to. All right, let's unplug this before there we go. And we'll get this well. That's kind of hot. A little bit. A little bit hot. All right. Um, now, I do have, I didn't think about this, but I got that really close to the edge right there. Um, this is PETG. The green is PETG. Uh, and we had a f couple of problems. So, the one thing with open pour molds, this is very shallow and there's not enough pressure head you know i don't have a column of uh metal like you would in a, a regular sand cast so you get this bulb bulbous shape on one side and i didn't have enough to cover the whole thing but um you get this it doesn't want to go down into the mold um you could uh well I'm, <laughs> i was going to show you the coin but it's right here it's melted um but that's the idea that you can you can melt metal with just these, assuming you get the low temperature stuff. Now it did it did overrun and get on the PETG, so it kind of melted the PETG. PETG does have a higher melting point than uh, than PLA, but it's not that high. But look, we actually got you know for the parts that we did get to work. Um, I I needed to melt more of this stuff. 
we actually got pretty good detail down in there for, for what we did. Let's see if we can zoom in on that. Clearly, we don't have an entire belt buckle. It's really hot, so I don't want to you know, mess with it. And we'd have a lot of cleanup because we have to um, you know, cut this part out where it overflowed and all that. So we'd have some work to do. But um, if I were to take again, and I would probably print this a little bit deeper, print it again so that I don't have the the edges peeled up because that's uh, going to let sand get underneath there. Um, so I'd print it a little thicker uh, that direction, but we actually got quite a bit of detail. In fact, um, the sand picked up, you can kind of see the infill on the top pattern there. You can kind of see it, it even picked that up a little bit. But that looks that looks surprisingly good for the piece that we did. I, it kind of makes me want to redo it and melt enough metal to not on camera, but uh, just later to do the whole thing. So if you need a metal part, you can do that. Let me turn this. Well, not that far down. Something like that. There. Now you can see the little details that are in there. It's still too hot for me to grab and mess with, so I'm not going to bother with it. Um, but you can get metal parts relatively simply this you, you know you don't really want to uh, you could melt the the lead version of these this then you have to deal with the fact that you've got actual lead in there um, but this this little thing can go up to I don't remember what temperature it can reach but it, it is good enough for all the low temperature metals I don't think you can melt aluminum in it or anything like that but the pewters and the bismuth based stuff um, you can uh, melt in just a little pot like that and it's relatively simple you don't have to have a forge or anything um, and even with this you get decent detail um, so things we could have done is probably picked a pattern that didn't try to create these little little tiny features like that and just meld them into one was probably better um, now again, this is half the size it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be twice this size, so that might have worked larger scale. Um, reprint this so it's got a little bit more thickness to it, so that because um, the surface tension of the metal is going to cause it to bulge up, like this piece did. Um, and then obviously melt enough metal to fill the whole thing, which I just didn't want to go cut it back. All right, it's cooled down. But that it actually looks surprisingly good we'd have to you know do a little trim up there with uh, this stuff you can cut with a hacksaw or whatever it doesn't matter um i don't have anything to wipe it off with though but it actually looks pretty good and it would work um and this this metal it's obviously going to be weaker than like aluminum or steel but it's not it's not weak you know you can't just well you can bend it um but it's not um it's not super weak or anything like that it is still metal and it will still do metal like things um this however uh the only way this works i tried something a little too fancy for this one and i put too many details in there and the the resin just got inside all of those grooves and grabbed onto them and it's not letting go if I ever get this apart, the mold will be destroyed. So this kind of printing the mold directly, I've had success with that um, when the mold was much simpler. It didn't have little crevices for it to go into. Um, I'll try a different one just so that we have something uh, that actually comes out of a mold and it just won't have as kind of the little tiny details in there. Um, I kind of think, I don't know where I put him. Oh yeah, here he is. I kind of think Skeletor was my favorite of these though it's pretty cool so if you want it to just look metal you do have some some options on that I don't know where I put the other little stand everything's kind of in disarray over here but you have rub and buff um, you have the dry brushing can make things look metal um, you can cast things just the details have to be um, dealt with so if you want those details you're gonna have to do an actual silicone mold I don't think I've ever made a video of doing a silicone mold of a 3D printed part. Um, I don't think I could do that live though. Maybe maybe I could do parts of it live and then we'd have to come back to it. Can't do it right now, but um, 
we'll, we'll do that. I'm not sure I have any silicone ready to go though. Um, but printing it directly just doesn't, just won't work unless you have very few details in there. See, I'm, I'm, I'm really, you shouldn't have to do all of that to get it apart. Um, I'll print another one that doesn't have that kind of detail and, and I'll cast it up and show you how that can work. Um, and then you have the option of actual metal. If you really, really need something metal, um, the, the one-sided mold, you can just print your little mold box. Try not to get the metal on the mold box because that does create problems. Um, and then this, this is a particular uh, clay. You, you could use just sand. Um, you're just, the, the, the course of the grain of the clay is gonna determine how much detail you can pick up and retain, retain in your mold is the only thing. So if you just got sand from like play sand, it's gonna have that very, uh, it'll obviously look cast. You'll have that cast texture to it, which might be good because that would hide some of the, the printing artifacts that you would have, the layer lines and things like that. The coarse sand wouldn't pick those up. Um, so I haven't tried that, but uh, it would be a way to uh, not have to get this. This is, you can get it probably on Amazon. Let's see. I'm not sure if that's where I got it or not. Yeah, you can get it. It's kind of expensive though. $50. I wouldn't get the casting kit with the two little rings for $100. Um, I would do what I did and just print some kind of mold box. Um, there's, there's the same type of thing, just a different brand. Um, I haven't used this, but obviously much cheaper. So $20 for five pounds of it. Um, you could probably get away with this kind of stuff. Um, it's just going to be a different brand. Um, and then the, let's see if I can find the little casting. These are all like furnaces. You don't really need that for the low temp thing. This one's called, the one I have is called, what's it called? The hot pot. This guy. Oh, it's not for sale right now, but that's it. Oh wow, I didn't pay that much for it too. There must be a like a hot pot three or something now. Oh, here it is. Oh, you didn't see that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so this is the the uh, little melter. Like I was saying, I bought it a couple of years ago apparently, but now it must be there must be a newer version or something because this one's way more expensive than what I paid for it. Um, and then the clay is this stuff. There's the, the brand name that I have, but I scrolled down and there's uh, Petrobon, which looks very similar to me, um, and it's much cheaper if you ever wanted to do that sort of stuff. Um, I, would, I wouldn't worry with the like furnaces. I would just get one of the, something like the hot pot, but for whatever reason, it's not available on Amazon. Well, not these, these are like cooking. Uh, well, yeah, they just don't have it on Amazon right now. There might be some other source for it. Don't know, but this is, this is what it was. <clears throat> okay. I think that gets us plenty of different options to do. Some very simple ones with the dry brush, some silver paint over some black paint, and you get something that looks kind of metallic-y. Um, or wood one. The one that I did here did not come out as well as... I've even lost the thing now. There's so much stuff scattered around here. But um, this, this version where you just do really thin coats and then coat it with something like this works pretty well. If I can cover it up. Get it uncovered. So this actually gives a decent wood texture, not texture, wood coloring. Um, particularly if you have something with ridges or something that's gonna capture some of that stain and hold it, um, it'll look darker. Kind of like in there, it's darker. Um, that's good. Rub and buff is pretty simple. It's a little harder to find. You have to go order it probably. Um, and it'll give you a metal uh, type coloring. Oh, in fact, I've got a, I do have some silver stuff.
This is rub and buff silver. So this piece is 3D printed. Uh, you kind of see it was this goldish color, which was just the color filament I had. But this is rub and buff silver with some of the rub and buff ebony in that area. So that looks relatively metallic. Uh, and I forgot about this one. If you want chrome, this is uh, this is from a resin printer though. Uh, we haven't looked at resin printers yet, um, but the base material here is a resin. Um, it doesn't matter. I was just making small parts on a resin printer uh, as an example. But this is actual painted on liquid chrome from Molotov. Let's see if I can find that on Amazon. I'll show you that. Molotov paint marker, liquid chrome. I think this is it. Yeah, one of these things. They do make just a refill, but this is from one of the pins. So, um, 12 ish dollars it looks like for this kind of pin. It lasts a long time. Um, one pin does, and it's a paint pin that you literally just paint it on. It kind of self levels, and you get a pretty good chrome simulation. Uh, on plastic or on any material but we're talking about 3d printed stuff so if you're looking for a way to make a chrome like piece then this is the best thing I've found there probably are others but this is the best one I've found you know you have the chrome spray paint and things like that they never look quite like chrome um, if that's what you're using the chrome spray paint paint it over something like this a gloss black and you'll have better luck with it um, this I just put directly on this part. So, you know, it's this green resin. I just painted directly on top of it and ended up with a pretty good chrome. So there's some different techniques for making different uh, finishes. Uh, if I come across any others that I haven't shown or maybe some that we want to revisit, uh, we'll do a thing like this again. But uh, for now, I think we're probably pretty good. Don't forget to take the quiz. Uh, you've got that coming up. It's open now. It should stay open until the 23rd. Uh, you get one attempt at it, 30 minutes uh, on that attempt, and it should be pretty straightforward. Assuming that you've been doing printing, then most of the questions are going to be obvious to you, uh, the answers to them, because it'll, it'll ask you things that you would have had to have done in order to uh, do some printing. If you haven't done any printing, like if you're just watching the videos and not doing any printing, then uh, some of the questions might not, you know, make sense and that'll, that might be a problem. But to work on that quiz, um, if you want to follow along next time in on Thursday, then get you a Raspberry Pi out uh, and we'll, we'll add Octoprint to our Ender 3. Um, that should be basically the whole thing that we do next time. All right. I think I'm going to let you go and we will come back Thursday.